Thank you for joining another Casework stream. We are here today. Um, I've got a very special guest on today, um, special because it's my brother. Um, and um, we are going to talk all things uh, mass tort related. And um, some of the some of the things that we're going to talk about is going to be, um, you know, where firms struggle. You know, Bill, what are your top recommendations? Um, how to mitigate fallout? How to manage high volume? and how to keep clients engaged. But real quickly, I'm going to let you introduce yourself and kind of give a little bit about your background. But just to set the set the stage, um, you know, Caseworks exists really because back in 2015, you approached me to um, help you on some medical review. That's and, right. And so you said you just need a little bit of help. Well, that that little bit of help turned into uh, we we got a lot of bit of help, <laughs> a lot of a lot of help. Lot. Uh, so anyway, that turned into Caseworks having a really large team, and um, at the onset, you know, we were um, devoted to your firm and, and helping you succeed. But then we just saw that there was, um, you know, a lot of need in the industry to have this outsourced um, solution, and and we'll kind of talk about these these things and really working with you is really what helped to develop some of Caseworks best practices. Um, so anyway, for those of you that are watching, this is my brother, Bill Barfield. Oftentimes, Bill, you, you've heard me say this. I get on a call and people will say, are you related to Bill Barfield? And I'll say yes. And they're like, man, I just really, I really love your brother. And, um, and I'll say, well, if you love him, you're going to really love me. <laughs> uh, I had an attorney that said, well, why is that? And I said, well, you know, I, I'm just, I'm better looking. I, I'm, I'm funnier and I'm smarter. And they said, well, That's right. gosh, That's right. uh, I said, okay, never mind. I'll give it to Bill. He is funnier than me. But um, anyway, um, I'll, I'll let you kind of go through a little bit of your background um, and, and just kind of set the tone of, you know, some of the discussions that we're going to have today. Sure. Uh, and thanks again, Susan, for having me on. And I'll curtail my background to uh, as it relates to mass torts uh, and, and how I got into the industry and working uh, where I am today. And so uh, that took me all the way back to when I was coming out of law school. I worked at a law firm here in Houston and we were working on nursing home cases and we decided to do these nursing home cases nationwide. Mm -hmm. That became somewhat of a mass tour. Mm -hmm. And then from that firm, I moved to the Lanier Law Firm, where we were handling thousands of mesothelioma cases, which that was in, in that was another mass tour. And then shortly after that, we um, went from working on meso cases. And certainly the Lanier Firm has uh, been many years working on product liability cases, whether it's medical device, pharmaceutical cases. But those are all types of cases that fall under the umbrella of a mass tort. And um, in the evolution of my practice, I now find myself managing a firm. And that's what we do primarily. Certainly, we handle one-off personal injury cases, which are great. Those are great for firms to have. And we have other different divisions. We have a class action division. But the majority of our practice centers around uh, a mass tort arena. And yeah, so that's my quick background. Yeah. And I think, um, thanks for sharing that. And I think, um, you know, some of the things we're going to talk about today is just really what you've learned um, working on both single event cases and how that is very different than a mass tort and handling high volume. I know that when we've worked with, let's say, personal injury attorneys that are used to really, um, you know, maybe handling a docket of maybe, let's say, 100 cases is really a lot to them. And then they get into... Um, a large investment in marketing and acquiring thousands of cases. It's just, um, it's a whole different ball game on how you manage those cases. Um, and, and more importantly, how do you keep those clients engaged? But I think, you know, one of the first things I'd like to kind of start off is talking about where you've seen firms struggle, um, just struggle in mass tort, or potentially having friends that are in personal injury and try to transition over to mass tort. You know, what are the areas that you see them struggle in? Okay. Easy, easy question to answer. Uh, it all revolves around the lack of technology. And, the, and when I mean technology, here's what I mean by that. Uh, technology, when it comes to the use of client communication, case development, and case resolution. Let me back up. 
most personal injury firms, most commercial litigation firms, they're great at handling a select few cases. They work them up and they settle for great for a great amount. That's awesome. But the dynamics change in the mass tort context. Here's the reason why. Because you're no longer working with a hand select few cases. You're now working with thousands of clients. And the difference between a, a handful of cases and a thousand are simply just the dynamics of, of communication as it relates to, um, to the client, mm -hmm. to your opposing counsel, to outside stakeholders, whether it's experts or whoever it might be. Uh, there's just so much more in terms of the communication that is putting a burden on the law firm itself. And so you have to have the technology in order to fully gain uh, the what's needed to properly handle these communications. Yeah, the technology really drives um, the efficiency and the operational decisions um, and, and also helping keep you know clients informed and engaged and um, I know you do this at your firm and I know um, I, I know who the um, employee is. That is kind of what we would call like the client management software at um, there. They're like the expert or the ambassador champion. You know, they I mean, it's a full time job to understand um, all the nuances about the management software system and to be able to leverage. Because I think what happens and I've seen firms, they'll say, well, what system do you work off of? Because I don't really like mine. It's not that they don't like theirs. It's that they don't know how to use it to the highest and best use so that it's helping to drive all the things that you just talked about. Uh, That's right. And, and here's what I have seen, that law firms are great at trying to understand and implement a marketing budget mm -hmm. and then executing on that marketing budget and then seeing the cases come into the firm. And that's all great. But once the cases or the new clients come to the firm, even before that, really, you have to manage those clients, manage those expectations. And that's all in the area of communication. And so as lawyers, we were always taught on how to bring clients to the firm. But really, the reality is we were never taught on what do we do when we have a large segment of clients? How do we handle that? How do we manage that? And what are we re really required to do ethically and just professionally for our clients? And that's where somebody, um, an IT liaison, somebody mm -hmm. can help manage those communications, the whole IT infrastructure when it comes to client communication, vendor communication, uh, communication with all the stakeholders, mm -hmm. somebody there that can help drive that process is so key to the firm on many aspects. Yeah, and I, I know we're gonna talk about client engagement, um, spending the dollars and then not keeping your clients engaged is certainly not gonna yield a good ROI. And so it's, I think for you, it, it's very different because your firm is, um, you know, not just a mass tort firm, you've uh, built a, a an empire of a lot of referral networks. And so, uh, the clients are not the only people that are holding you accountable. Those attorneys are wanting to know what are the communication um, and you have to be able to keep them informed and engaged on what's what's happening to the cases that they referred over. But kind of talking a little bit about client um, communication, because as we all know, we can work the case up. That's awesome. Um, it is a fully compensable case. And but at the time of settlement, if you can't get those plaintiffs on the phone, it's uh, it, it's it's a big issue. It's a okay. big issue for um, the amount of money that you've spent to work it up. If there's a funder involved, it's a big issue for them. And so I know we, we've we employed a lot of um, interesting techniques um, to you know help to keep clients engaged. What, what do you do at your firm as far as client engagement? And okay, so the number one rule that we employ at our firm is you can't start trying to contact the client at the time of settlement. That doesn't work. It will never work. Uh, and ultimately, that would lead to a very bad outcome. And so backing up, what do we do as a firm? We start engaging with our client from the very beginning, okay? And then throughout the process, the discovery process, which is you file the case, you go through discovery, that includes plaintiff fact sheets, uh, whatever it might be. We are trying to maintain a consistent relationship with those clients. And how do we do that? We utilize the technology of a case management system, all the other parts that surround that case management system. 
we find out what is the client like? How do they like to be communicated with? Do they like emails, text messages? What is it that they like? Whatever it is, we try to uh, dictate how we communicate or we dictate our mm -hmm. message around what they're used to. Because ultimately the goal is this, uh, whenever, whether it's discovery or whether it's settlement, we need to be able to get in touch with that client. Why? Because the client ultimately makes the decisions when it comes to settlement. And so we need them to be engaged and we need to be fully informing those clients early on in the process. So settlement is much easier and it's a shorter span versus having a protracted span because you just simply can't get in touch with a client. But yeah, and I think one thing that you guys have done really well, and, and we kind of stole the idea, was um, sending out videos. I mean, just putting video in the subject line of an email, yes. we're seeing like an 85% open rate. Um, and that's, you know, we need people to um, open up the email. And sometimes it's some lengthy directions that we need clients to do. But if you if you record a two minute video, they're going to watch that, but they're not going to read all the content. So we, we saw that was very effective. And, and so we, we are doing that as well. And so that's effective not only for clients, Susan, but it's also very effective for referral counsel, for just simply just general marketing in whether it's LinkedIn or whatever it might be. Uh, the reality is that people like to watch and learn by watching, not simply by reading some text. OK, and that's I take that. That's personally my I, I prefer that more than anything else. I certainly can read what's on the screen, but just listening and hearing it from somebody just reemphasizes the message. And that certainly helps. Yeah, for sure. And, and we know um, we've gone into some firms that asked us to come in and, and help complete an audit on, you know, 10,000 cases, 10,000 plus cases where they've sat on those cases. Like you said, don't wait till settlement. Well, one, either they're not going to answer or they've already gone and signed up with someone else. They're going to have a dual rep issue. Um, and so just just starting from the point at which there's a signed retainer and having nurturing campaigns, keeping them informed, is just going to mitigate the fallout and mitigate the dual rep issues. And that um, goes back, Susan, to the struggle with most firms that are coming into this mass tort arena, which uh, it's a great uh, atmosphere. And uh, I love the colleagues uh, and the professional relationships I've developed. But new lawyers coming in they do not appreciate the need for protocols that need to be in place mm -hmm. so that this technology can be, uh, or the decisions about communication, engagement with clients, there can be protocols in place so that the technology through the use of the protocols with the technology, that their goals can be met. And what are those goals to consistently routinely communicate with these clients? What and what's the ultimate objective to lower the uh, dual rep where you have other where you have other lawyers that uh, also represent the same client, which is uh, common in the mass tort industry. Uh, but the overarching goal is create a communication piece and engagement with your client and all of those problems will be reduced. Yeah, and I think it can sound daunting to attorneys that haven't handled um, let's just say a thousand cases. They might say, well, I mean, a thousand cases. How am I going to be sending out, you know, recording videos? And how do I um, all the text messaging? I mean, if you have a, a robust management software system, you do that on a mass level. So you create one video, you send it out to everybody. Or, and it can be specific to, let's say you need, um, you know, a driver's license on a hundred cases because the facility rejected the electronic, whatever the case may be. You can you can mass email text. Um, and communicate with the client so it's not as daunting as it may seem to those that haven't handled um, high volume. Yes, that's a perfect example because, again, uh, we as lawyers, we're trained on how to handle cases. And typically, coming out of law school, uh, we're, we're handling a select few cases. But now you're put in, in an arena where you're handling thousands of cases at one time. And the reality is if you don't have the technology and you do and you don't have the protocols in place and the people who have done this before, um, then your system is going to be burdensome to you. Mm -hmm. So it's a combination of three things. It really is technology, 
the correct people and the correct protocols. Yeah. You put those two together and you're going to have very successful outcomes or yeah. great outcomes. Yeah, for sure. You, you hit on something earlier, which I think this is not talked about enough in the industry is it really starts with having a strict criteria and getting quality leads through the top of the funnel. Um, we, we've worked with firms, their philosophy is just go out and get as many cases and, and let's just see kind of what happens. And then we have firms that are really like the criteria is really strict, stringent. I know they're paying more money for those leads. Um, but when you compare, um, you know, the throughput of those cases and the success, the client engagement, all of that, traditionally we have seen higher stats on um, getting cases to being fully compensable with, with engaged clients, those firms that, um, really leverage a, a stricter criteria. And we can talk about, you know, kind of what, what your firm does as it, as it relates to the criteria, but what's sure. your thought on that? Yeah. So my thought is simply this, here's the reality. This industry has evolved over the last 10 or 15 years. So if we were to take this same industry 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that really was the model was to simply take mm -hmm. in everything that you can and then figure out along with the defendants, what is a compensable case? And with the court's help, we would figure this all out together. OK, now, how has the industry changed today? Well, the one thing that's changed is the fact that there's so many more plaintiffs. The technology that mm -hmm. we have and the marketing that we have has allowed us to go out and. Um, there's so many new channels to connect with people. That's correct. And so because of that, there's so many more clients. Mm -hmm. in, with that as a foundation piece, uh, you need a strict criteria so that you're only pulling in uh, the, the clients that ultimately will be compensable because it does cost so much money to work up these cases. Yeah. And I, and I think back to when we first started working together and just, I mean, I was just astounded by the volume of no record founds that were coming back. I mean, it was just it blew my mind. It was blowing. We were blowing money. It's just a lot, you know? And so we started trying to analyze like what, why do we have so many no record founds? And, and I remember the analysis indicated um, really some simple things that, you know, we, we, there were things that we could change and things that were a little more challenging, but things such as, uh, well, we have to always remember that clients are poor historians first off. And so, uh, they gave us wrong dates. Well, we were trying to order, you know, with a real strict date range versus just, you know, widen that date range because they're going to be off several years. Um, there was the wrong facility. You know, they would they would tell us uh, Walmart is where they got the farm, uh, their prescription. In reality, it was Walgreens. And so that that's time and money that we're wasting. And then it was going after chasing cases where the incident level or the incident date or when we were trying to obtain records was past the seven year retention uh, rate that we're seeing the national retention rate. And so, you know, we, I remember providing you with this analysis of how quickly it fell off the ability to obtain records from facilities after, you know, at seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 years. Um, and so I think that was really eye opening. And I, and I try to share that with attorneys that we start working with because, you know, they're whoever they're working with the, the marketing team, you know, they're trying to, um, say, oh, you know, just we can we can go back 20 years. Well, sure, you can get clients that have incident dates or had issues 20 years ago, but I'm not gonna be able to get the records for you to prove the case up. Um, so kind of what's your thought on uh, and how have you, how has that changed over the years when we talk about strict criteria, one being just um, those dates that we're trying to obtain records? Sure. And once again, like you just said, Susan, this has evolved over the last five to 10 years. Uh, now more and more, you're seeing law firms that focus on inverting the funnel or mm -hmm. turning that funnel yeah. over and using that strict criteria. Mm -hmm. And I go back to the point, why would you do that? Well, simply because it does cost so much money to work up these cases and it reduces the risk that the law firm has in this certain docket that they're investing their time, energy and their money in. Uh, right. And so you put all that together, you have to have the strict criteria. Now, at some point in the future, if that criteria is able to, you're able to expand it, that's great. But at least in the beginning, start out with something strict so that you can manage your budget, manage the marketing budget, manage the actual 
overhead that you're having to use utilize just to simply work up the case. Yeah. Uh, but the, the reality is this, without that team and without the technology, what I have seen as a struggle with law firms is that they feel like, well, the same staff that was handling these personal injury cases, they can handle these mass tort cases. And that's true for the most part with a caveat. They can't simply do the mass tort cases without the technology, and they say, they certainly can't do the mass tort cases and the workload that they were doing with the personal injury cases. There's just a lot going on with our, uh, with mass tort cases in general. So back to your point on technology, you've got mm -hmm. to have the technology. You have to have the outsourcing, uh, whether it's personnel or just simply the management of the cases. And then you just need to be driven in terms of getting the best select criteria that you need for these cases. Yeah, for sure. And I guess the only other thing I'd probably add to that is if you are, you know, trying to manage thousands of cases, you're going to need a really good telephony platform because just the simple old dial dialing clients, trying to reach them for whatever the myriad of missing information, whatever new uh, form has been released that you need to obtain yes. information. I mean, you just can't, you can't manage it efficiently. Um, the same right. systems that you use prior to. That's right. The, 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 yes. Telephone systems have to be top notch and they have to be able to communicate with your computer system. And without that, you cannot have a fragmented, fragmented system in this industry because it will certainly reveal itself uh, in time when you don't want it to reveal itself at the time of settlement or just simply at the time of needing to communicate with these clients, proper telephone system, and you need to have the people in place that can utilize the robust telephone system that you have. Uh, you need to have a team that's dedicated to inbound and mm -hmm. outbound marketing. I say marketing, it's just communication with sure. those clients. Yeah. Um, yeah for sure. And if that telephone system is able to communicate with your case management system, then that lessens the burden on your staff and it creates an efficiency that is, is hard to reproduce. Yes. Yes. 100%. And then over and above the telephone system, um, you need to, on an umbrella level or the overarching level, you need to be thinking about security for your law firm uh, and security when it comes to the data that you're housing for your clients and you have thousands of clients and you're housing their medical information, personal information. All of this has to be secure and it has to be properly backed up. We have a system that's backed up several times a day um, and it's secured on multiple levels. Mm -hmm. So uh, what we're seeing is that we now are becoming lawyers that are dedicated to organizing data and making sure this same data is properly secured and properly utilized uh, or else that creates a tremendous amount of liability for us as the law firm and all the stakeholders that are involved in this case itself. Yeah. Well, that's a whole nother stream just on itself on, on what's required from a, um, from a security perspective. Oh, 100%. It's we spend, lot. we spend several hours mm -hmm. a week talking about, how is our system secure? How can we make it more secure? And when, what are those steps that we need to take? Uh, because that's on the forefront of our mind, because all the reality is all it takes is one sure. issue of some sort of data breach uh, in, at any level. And so that creates so much downtime for our firm yeah. and cost us so much money. That's irrespective of just the violations that we have in terms of our client information. Yeah. For sure. Well, this has been great. Um, I appreciate you taking time yes. and sharing this information. Um, I think that like we talked about before, this is going to be the start to, to mini series and um, for people to just get bite size information on um, things that we've learned over the years. Obviously, you've been doing this a lot longer than me, but things that you've learned and been able to leverage to be able to um, handle the volume of cases that you're able to handle successfully. Listen, I appreciate you having me on, Susan. I would say, what is the takeaway from this? It deals in it deals with uh, a couple of concepts, but I think we've we've said it. Technology is certainly mm -hmm. what drives 
um, the success of the firm and having the technology with the processes in place and having the people, whether it's in your firm or with a firm like yours, Caseworks, whatever it might, whoever it might be, the people, protocols, and the technology, if they're working together, you will ultimately have some great successful yeah. outcomes. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Thank you.